it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the GAPI Levin's Erkenntnis Lecture, and even a greater pleasure to welcome Serena Soretti as our second keynote speaker. Now, Serena is a research professor at the University of Pompeo Fabra at Barcelona and has worked very extensively on topics in moral and political philosophy, including topics such as desert and justice, the ethics of the market, responsibility, voluntariness, etc., etc. In recent years, I believe that she has focused predominantly on questions of justice in relation to the family, and it is in this vein that she is going to talk about who should pay for the costs of children today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. This is my first um, in-person presentation since pre-pandemic times, so it's strange to see little faces rather than big squares with names. Um, so, I'm also very glad to have this opportunity to talk about my most recent attempt at settling a question I've been grappling with for a while about who should pay for the cost of children. Now, all welfare states distribute if to different degrees many of the costs of children across society at large among parents and non-parents. Policies such as publicly funded parental leave, free or subsidized childcare, child benefits, distribute among all citizens some of the costs of raising children, that is the costs of bringing up children from needy newborns until adulthood. Welfare states also distribute among all citizens the costs of what I call added adult members, that's to say the costs of funding the claims new persons will make on the welfare state once they become adults, such as health care, unemployment benefit, pensions and pension costs. States distribute these costs equally among parents and non-parents, just insofar as the tax revenues that fund them are paid by all citizens whose tax liability is not greater if and because they're parents. Now call this type of familiar arrangement standard welfare. Familiar though it is, it is not the only way we could set up our institutions. Suppose that under otherwise just background conditions, such that no adults are unjustly better off or worse off than other adults, we could ensure that children's needs and other claims of justice are met by letting most of all the costs of raising them and of providing any welfare benefits they receive once they're adults fall on parents. In this regime, parents would pay fully for the costs of, say, taking, unpaid, par, par, taking parental leave, of childcare provision, of school, maybe of health for their children while they're growing up, and moreover, their liability would extend through their children's adulthood they would have to contribute a special parent tax to ensure that they pay for their adult children's benefits. Parents could pay for this cost for a collective fund rather than individually to make it feasible. Now call this type of arrangement parents pay. Liberal egalitarians almost invariably assume, like most of us, that a just society ought to distribute the costs of children in the way in which standard welfare does, rather than parents pay but they have not offered a sustained defense of this assumption. And moreover, for reasons that I will discuss, giving an affirmative answer to the question at hand, the question of whether the costs of children should be distributed among non-parents as well as parents, is more challenging for liberal egalitarianism than first meets the eye, because of various commitments of that view, such as the commitment to holding individuals responsible. I will say more about this shortly. So these commitments seem to actually militate against asking all citizens to share the costs of children. So my main question is, can standard welfare be defended as more just than parents pay within liberal egalitarianism and specifically as more just because fair to parents? Now, arguing that fairness to parents requires that some of the costs of children be shared would enable us to capture what I think is a very commonly voiced insight in both public and in academic debates, albeit not among liberal egalitarian theories of justice, by those who endorse what is sometimes called the public goods argument for sharing the costs of children, and by those who claim that we need to do justice to reproductive work. The central insight is that by having and rearing children, parents create important public goods for the rest of society or, or perform socially valuable, indeed necessary work and that it would be unfair to parents for others to not share the costs of children while reaping the benefits. 
Now, whether this argument can be defended, vindicated, depends crucially on whether there is a defensible normative principle that can vindicate that charge of unfairness, that intuitive charge of unfairness. Why exactly is it unfair to producers of public goods or those who engage in socially valuable activities for others to benefit without sharing in the costs of productions of those goods? And can this unfairness charge be made on behalf of parents? So that's, that's the more specific question that I'm addressing. And my main aim is to develop a principle of fairness that enables us to answer this question affirmatively. I will call this principle, I will refer to it as an egalitarian principle of productive fairness. Um, and I will develop it by working and drawing on some parts of a theory of equality uh, developed by Ronald Dworkin, equality of resources, which I interpret in a particular way. Now, I should just say two things very briefly. The first is that I think that my interpretation of Dworkin's theory is the correct one, but I don't need to defend that claim. I can't try and defend that claim. Maybe there are some Dworkinians among you who will take issue with me or who would take issue with me on that score. Uh, but I just, I, that's not my aim today. My aim today is just to say here is a, a plausible view of productive fairness, which uh, I believe Dworkin provides when interpreted in a certain way, and that's what I'm interested in defending. A second uh, point I would like to briefly make is that I won't describe at length the debate to which I'm um, aiming to contribute today. It's a small, but I think fairly lively and important debate on the question I'm addressing, the question of parental justice, to which I aim to make a new contribution. And it's a debate whose main philosophical contributors have been Rolf George, Eric Rakowski, two colleagues of mine, uh, Paula Casal and Andrew Williams uh, at Pompeo Fabra, uh, Peter Valentine, Hillel Steiner, uh, and a few others. Now, I'll proceed in, in four main steps. So in part one, I'll frame the problem I'm concerned with more fully, and I'll explain why it appears difficult to develop a case for sharing the cost of children within the framework of liberal egalitarianism. And in particular, I identify two main challenges that the um, defender of sharing the cost of children has to grapple with, liability for ambition and no need for incentives, and some further constraints on how we have to proceed when trying to meet those challenges. Then in part two, I briefly discuss two ways of arguing for standard welfare um, that do not invoke productive fairness considerations. One appeals to gender equality and the other appeals to the principle of fair play. And I suggest that both, while valid, are incomplete. And then in parts three and four, I, de I develop the fairness-based case. So I, in part three, I show that endorsing liability for ambitions does not, contrary to what many have thought, challenge the case for sharing the cost of children and then turn to formulate a principle of productive fairness and apply to the case of sharing the cost of children. And finally, in part four, I defend uh, that uh, view uh, from the second challenge, no need for incentives, by showing that we have reason to reject the conviction it expresses. So with liability for ambitions, I uh, endorse the uh, rationale for it, but think it doesn't have the implications it's claimed to have. With no need for incentives, I reject uh, the reasons for reducing it and reject the claim that is made. A few clarifications um, before proceeding. Let me emphasize what I've already said at the very outset. I'm assuming uh, just background conditions. Specifically, I'm assuming that what's at issue in the debate that I'm engaging with is not whether the claims of children would be met, Right? So we, we, we all agree, everybody in this debate agrees that the claims of children have to be met, but rather who should pay for meeting the claims of children. So children justice, childhood justice uh, is not uh, in question. And furthermore, as I already mentioned, I assume also that any inequalities between adults, including adults who are parents, are not independently unjust. So they're not in, uh, unjust by the lights of some other uh, part of our theory of justice, for example, the part of a theory of justice that may require that people who are less talented should not be penalized as a result. So any inequalities that exist will uh, not be condemned by uh, justice. 
Second, with regard to the cost of children, I'd like to highlight that I'm only concerned with a subset of the cost of children. I'm, I, as I've mentioned, I think what is in discussion is whether both the costs of raising children, but also the costs of children as added members once they're adults, whether those should be shared or should be internalized mostly by parents or fully by parents. But with regard to both those types of costs, we're only focusing on a subset, namely on those costs that are morally required, or even more specifically, the costs that are required by justice, that's to say that someone must bear in order for people's claims of justice while they're children and then once they're adults um, to be met. So there are going to be costs such as, for example, the costs of um, sending children to private schools or uh, the costs of uh, uh, buying extremely expensive clothing items for your children that are irrelevant. And that's one reason for me why Many of the estimates that currently exist of the cost of children have to be taken with a grain of salt because they just, these estimates just look at what parents in fact spend on average uh, on children. Some of these costs are not ones that I would suggest need to be socialized. Um, as for the benefits of children, um, this is my third clarification, I have in mind the various often cited benefits of demographic renewal. So the creation and raising of members of each new generation into competent adults whose socially valuable contributions as actors in the economy, as taxpayers, as citizens, are necessary for the continuation of any society, including a just society. And you'll notice throughout, I'll, I'll talk variously of uh, children as public goods, because that's how I first started thinking about this, and that's how often people refer to these kinds of arguments. Uh, but I'll also, as I've already mentioned, talk about um, uh, parents discharging socially necessary or socially valuable work. I think the differences, it, whatever there may be uh, uh, between these various formulations are not relevant for my argument. What matters for me is the following, that what parents do under certain conditions is work of which is true that we would pay for it to be done if we had to pay for it to be done. Um, just very quickly, um, Notice that I assume that parents collectively are the relevant uh, benefit uh, producers. That's right, here I said beneficiaries, benefit producers, and that parents having and raising children is the socially valuable activity. I don't think that just merely adding members to the population uh, without taking responsibility for raising them, is, it, that's not what I'm focusing on. Um, and finally, uh, one thing that I, that I wish, this is, this is a fairly loaded assumption. It's, it's, th th in fact, it's not an assumption. I mean, there are arguments for this, but um, I wish to emphasize that the fairness-based costs for socializing the costs of children is not the same as, and I believe it doesn't have to commit us to a pronatalist position, where the latter is a position that either favors or condones an increase in fertility or a large population size. So just to emphasize, uh, the argument that I will make is not a forward-looking argument that establishes that we have reasons to incentivize adults to have more children. Nor do, do I, does the argument, assume that parents having and raising children provides a net benefit regardless of the number of children that they have. Instead, what I assume is that some number of children constitute net benefits and focus on the question of whether, with regard to that number, a just society should distribute their costs across all citizens. So I won't discuss the partly empirical premise on which this assumption holds, but I acknowledge, uh, as I'm sure most of, most of you or all of you do, that, that what that number is is a complex issue that, among other things, needs to be sensitive to considerations of climate justice. Um, so these considerations require that any one country's population size has to be such that that country can live within its sustainability frontier, this is a term I adopt from Caney. And so my discussion focuses on whether all citizens, rather than just parents, should bear the costs of the children that are compatible with the countries living within its sustainability frontier. Now, with these clarifications in mind, let me just turn to framing the question I'm concerned with and bring into view why it's so challenging uh, to answer it affirmatively. Now, during the COVID pandemic, I'm sure you've heard this before, talk of the crisis of care has made more prominent within public discourse, claims which feminists had been making for decades concerning the need to do justice to unpaid caring work, of which reproductive work is a sizable part. 
Now, I take reproductive work to refer to having and raising children here. It's work insofar as it's a socially organized activity that has a purpose beyond itself, so it's not the same as leisure. The performance of which involves substantial costs, among other things, in terms of financial resources, and which directly and indirectly serves the needs of others. So, to put it in Paul Gomberg's term, uh, reproductive work does qualify as a socially organized contribution to a larger group. Now, those who do most of this work, women, suffer a number of disadvantages. And although these vary across countries and uh, within them, also in line with other factors, such as what group, uh, racialized group or class group one belongs to, they're wide ranging. It's no wonder then that feminists of various stripes, Marxists, libertarians, liberal, have all called attention to the problem of reproductive work being unpaid and or disadvantageous to those who carry it out. I will not read these quotes, but I've just reproduced some of uh, uh, the many statements here by feminists of, uh, from uh, different political positions who have tried to align the need to do justice to reproductive work. So Silvia Federici is one of the, was one of the founders of the Wages for Housework Initiative in 1972. Uh, Marxist, uh, writing from very different uh, economic liberal quarters. Shirley Burgraff, the second quote, uh, also points to the importance of doing justice to reproductive work. Um, legal philosopher Martha Feynman is uh, the author of the third quote. Nancy Folber uh, is cited here. Is, she's a feminist economist who has been arguing sustainedly over the last three decades to defend various forms of the public goods argument for sharing the cost of children. And the last two quotes are uh, more kind of uh, general public writings written recently by the authors of Feminism for the 99% and the Care Collective. Well, what about liberal egalitarian theorists of justice? What have, it, what have they had to say about justice and reproductive work? Very briefly, um, what do I mean by liberal egalitarians here? I mean just a very broad family of views that defend civil, uh, certain canonical civil and political liberties and uh, equal socioeconomic opportunities. Um, though in a moment I will make clear that actually the version of liberal egalitarianism that I'm working within and that uh, makes it especially challenging to develop a case for the cost of children is a subset of the broad family of views. Now, liberal egalitarian theories of justice have typically formulated principles for regulating societies uh, made up of individuals whose creation, cares, care, and numbers are just taken as given. Sometimes they say this explicitly. Ronald Dworkin, for example, in Sovereign Virtues, says explicitly he takes a stipulated population size. Uh, others don't say anything about population size at all. Um, the same is true, by the way, of, of kind of classic libertarian theories of justice. Um, now, it's true, I should say, that long pressed by feminists, uh, liberal egalitarians, including those who have formulated the well-known theories of justice I've um, cited there, uh, have increasingly acknowledged the importance of paying attention to the fact that women do uh, reproductive work. So, for example, engaging, uh, as you may know, with Susan Moller Okin's challenge to a theory of justice, Rawls acknowledges explicitly that, I'm quoting him here, reproductive work is socially necessary labor. But he doesn't belabor what follows from that fact, other than that women should not have fewer opportunities than men as a result of doing more of it. A point I'll come back to um, shortly. So mostly liberal egalitarians have just ignored uh, the question of uh, reproductive work or the question of who should pay for the cost of children. And upon inspe inspection, moreover, liberal egalitarian theories might appear inhospitable to a case for socialization. Now here are two main challenges uh, that uh, that case faces within liberal egalitarianism. The first one, which I call here liability for ambitions, is the view that insofar as people freely choose to be parents or identify with this life plan, there is no egalitarian objection against or under some conditions there may even be an egalitarian case in favor of disadvantage accruing to parents as a result of that choice of life plan, as a result of having that ambition. I'm using ambition in that sense to refer to life plan or project, something that one endorses as uh, given one's own view of what makes a life a successful or good life. 
The second challenge, no need for incentives, is the claim that if people, as is generally true of parents, would perform an activity even if they had to pay its costs, the fact that that, the fact that, that the activity is socially necessary makes no difference to their claims to having others share the costs of children. Now, I think these two challenges are hard enough, but they're made even harder to surmount by the fact that within a subset of liberal egalitarianism that I'm interested in working within, some ways of working our way around these challenges are barred. So more specifically, if we endorse a neutrality-respecting non-welfare variant of liberal egalitarianism, as I'm assuming, it's going to be particularly difficult to uh, reject or to rebut these two challenges. So just to illustrate, we may not appeal to welfareist considerations to argue that assuming that sharing costs with parents uh, is necessary to secure for them the same opportunity for welfare as the welfare we secure for the Malibu surfer. He's the paradigm or one of the paradigms of people we shouldn't share costs with on this uh, uh, responsibility sensitive variant of egalitarianism. So we, can't, we cannot appeal, we may not appeal to welfare considerations uh, to make a case for why the parents, despite the fact that uh, she or he chooses uh, to, um, to uh, parent, or she, he or she identifies with this ambition, should not be held liable for the fact that his ambition is costlier to satisfy. We may also not appeal to perfectionist considerations or considerations that um, uh, invoke particular views of the good, um, to say or to justify why we as a community are justified uh, in uh, sharing the costs of children, but not subsidize surfing, right? So we may not say that parenting is a valuable project, but spending all day uh, surfing is not. Incidentally, I also want to say here that I also think that sometimes when people think about um, the public goods argument or why reproductive work should be somehow accommodated or compensated, they may be thinking, I'm not sure how, of how many people this is true, but they may be thinking of something like dessert claims. And again, I'm assuming that those are not uh, justifiable uh, within a neutralist conception of liberal equality. And finally, I also assume the following. I assume that a commitment to equality prevents us from adopting a principle of producer entitlement. And by that, I mean that people just have full private property rights over both their bodily and mental talents, so self-ownership rights, full self-ownership rights, as libertarians call them, and to whatever they can come to acquire by mixing their labor, um, uh, by mixing their labor with, so the fruits of their labor. So I don't think, I don't, as egalitarians, I think there are many reasons. I also don't believe in, in that people have full private property rights over themselves. Uh, but as egalitarians, uh, and in order, among other things, to avoid certain odd implications regarding ownership of children, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't uh, assume producer entitlement. Now, especially with our hands tied in this way, so we've got these two challenges, we've got these further constraints, it's tempting to think that we should abandon the attempt to formulate a defensible version of the fairness-based argument and instead offer an account of why injustice, um, of the injustice, sorry, of disadvantaging those who do reproductive work solely through the lenses of concerns about gender equality. Now, this is a response I've, I've often encountered. So people will say, I agree that the costs of children ought to be shared, but it's only because it is unjust that women disproportionately do bear the costs of children. So on the proposed gender inegalitarian reading, it's unjust for reproductive work to, to be disadvantageous only if and because women do it disproportionately. And various feminists have argued that um, the fact that women disproportionately do this does mean that it creates uh, a number of uh, inequalities. So it has uh, uh, kind of ripple effects for women's uh, uh, opportunities in the job market and other positions of advantage, among other things. Now, notice that on this reading, the failure to share at society-wide level the cost of reproductive work, for example, lack of publicly funded parental leave and childcare, may be unjust, but only derivatively. That is to say, not sharing the cost of children society-wide is unjust only if and because Assuming that women will continue to do the lion's share of work, it is important to diminish the comparative disadvantage of women relative to men. 
and or only if and because socialization is a necessary and effective means to stop women from doing the lion's share of reproductive work. So because of this, the gender inequalitarian reading of the injustice of reproductive work will not recommend socializing the cost of children, for example, in a society in which all heterosexual man-woman households with children realize Susan waller okins equal split proposal. So this is a proposal whereby men and women divide equally paid, uh, uh, sorry, unpaid uh, uh, domestic work. Nor uh, does this reading of what is unjust recommend sharing the cost of children, socializing them in a society in which there is what Richard Arneson calls statistical equal split rather than household level equal splits. That's, that's to say, if we take all households aggregatively, women and men come out as sharing equally reproductive work and paid work. So the gender inegalitarian reading of the problem of reproductive work differs from the fairness arguments, both in its diagnosis about what is fundamentally unjust and possibly in terms of what it prescribes to recommend the injustice it detects. Now, let me say outright that it seems to me clearly true that gender inequality is an important component of the injustice uh, in the current arrangements we have around reproductive work. This is not in doubt. But in my view, the gender egalitarian reading captures only half of uh, the truth about that injustice. So, in particular, I think that what exercises feminists, like the ones that I mentioned earlier, that I quoted earlier, and rightly so, are two facts which, while tightly close together are independent. One is the fact that there is an unequal and gender division of reproductive work, where that injustice is not reducible to the unfairness of reproductive works being costly. But the other is that it is unfair that reproductive work is costly, where that unfairness in turn is not reducible to the injustice of that works being unequally distributed along gender lines. And the second claim is the target of the fairness argument. That's what the fairness argument is trying to vindicate. And it does need uh, vindicating, I think, because if it were not vindicated, if the injustice of the gender division of reproductive work were fully reducible to the injustice of that works being unequally distributed al along gender lines, then feminists would have no more reason to condemn the unfairness of women's doing the lion's share of reproductive work than they would of condemning the injustice of a social scheme in which women are confined by social norms and other institutions to, say, uh, the unpaid work of counting grains of sand, or more realistically, the injustice of women incurring substantial material and health costs, which men do not or have not until now in order to live up to gendered beauty norms. Right? So I think there is injustice in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the fact that the work in question is unfairly costly unpaid work, not just that it's unequally divided. I'll be quick because I'm worried I will otherwise have to be too quick later. Another way of trying to answer uh, or to um, buttress the fairness argument is by appeal to a principle which sometimes confusingly is called the principle of fairness, but uh, it's also uh, known as the principle of fair play. And this was a principle that uh, Herbert Hart first uh, advanced and then Rawls, uh, both pre theory of justice and then in theory of justice, uh, adopted. Uh, now, according to this principle, when a number of people engage in a mutually advantageous cooperative venture according to rules and restrict their liberty in ways necessary to yield advantages for all, those who have submitted to these restrictions have a right to similar acquiescence on the part of those who have benefited from their submission. Rawls also sometimes puts this, the, the central point of the principle as saying that we shouldn't take advantage of others' cooperative labor. Now, the reason why I mentioned the fair play principle here is because um, in the small debate of, that I've mentioned around sharing the cost of children, as in many other debates, the fair play principle has kind of been plucked out of um, uh, its context, which I think is quite limited, I now think is quite limited, and has been used to try and defend the case for sharing the cost of children. And, and critics have objected to this. I, in my past work, have tried to show that the critics' criticisms were unwarranted and that a fair play case could be made. I now believe that um, while we could make some claims by appeal to fair play, they're not the full story. 
I hope I can uh, get this across uh, in the following way uh, uh, and rather briefly. I now believe that the principle of fair play, properly understood, is a principle for individuals, and specifically it's a principle that identifies the reasons which individuals have to comply with the demands that just institutions make of them. Right? So it's a principle that says, under some circumstances, individuals have obligations to do their fair share because others have done their fair share. So it would be unfair to those who have cooperated to not do what the cooperative scheme requires of one. What's crucially at issue in the parental justice debate, however, is what that fair share is in the first place and what demands a scheme of cooperation should make of parents and non-parents in order to be just. And this is what we're asking when we ask whether society's institutions should be arranged so as to realize standard welfare or parents pay. I'm sorry, that I should have moved to that slide sooner. Okay, now back then to searching for a principle of productive fairness. So as I've said, we, we would like to have a normative uh, uh, basis for saying that those who do reproductive work, assuming that it is socially valuable or necessary work, have a claim to having the cost of children be shared. And as I've said, that principle should not be just a principle of desert, nor a principle of producer entitlement, nor can we appeal to welfareism. So what do we do? Well, so I now suggest that we have to, let's proceed here in two steps. So first negative steps consist in dismantling the conviction that a commitment to holding individuals liable for their choices or ambitions straightforwardly grounds a case against sharing the costs of those ambitions. Because so I think that's, that's something that often uh, it, uh, buttresses the resistance to the case for uh, socializing the cost of children. And then in the second more positive step consists in showing that the commitment to equality of a certain kind, as I've said, equality um, uh, of resources, as I understand it, uh, formulated by Dworkin, tells in favor of treating productive ambitions, ambitions, that's to say, the exercise of which produces what others need or want, differently from non-productive ones. Now, um, I now just go through these two points in turn. So first, the uh, kind of the negative uh, part. Consider the common view, which is that if we are egalitarians who are responsibility sensitive, and assuming, as I do, that most parents choose to have children or choose or identify with their ambition to have children, then uh, there is a presumption in favor of holding them liable for the costs of children. Here is a statement, there are several, by uh, a colleague, Matthew Clayton, whose view is uh, of liberal egalitarian justice draws on Dworkins. He says, it's difficult to see how individuals who choose to found a family have a justified case for resource transfers from those who prefer to remain childless. Any inequality of opportunity or income that is the product of having children compared to remaining childless is not the product of unequal good luck, but rather the result of a difference in ambitions. So it's true, um, uh, defenders of this position admit that having and rearing children carries a number of disadvantages, right? So it, 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 there are lots of resources have to be invested in raising children. But this, socioeconomic, this, this material disadvantage in terms of time as well as, as, as uh, financial resources, this uh, material disadvantage, as we know from um, uh, the literature on, on responsibility sensitive equality, is compatible with the ideal of equality. So uh, no egalitarian um, assumes now that no inequalities are justified. So inequalities, some inequalities are seen as the uh, appropriate result of people's uh, exercise of responsibility and ones that they may be held liable for. So the reasoning here is uh, children or having children are an expensive taste in that particular sense, right? So they provided that parents choose to have and raise children, any cost that they incur is a cost that they can be held liable uh, for. So just to uh, kind of uh, uh, emphasize or, or, or to bring an analogy that may be helpful to mind, just as it would be unfair, we might think for the, to the non-gambler to subsidize gambling, um, so it would be unfair for non-parents to subsidize the parental project. And in fact, uh, 
the reasoning continues. It, the ideal of equality itself, right? so it's not as if we have an ideal or a commitment to responsibility that is plucked out of somewhere else. It's, it's the very ideal of equality that tells in favor of holding uh, people liable for their ambitions. If we redistributed resources from the, um, from the successful gambler, uh, oh, sorry, from the non-gambler, say in this case, to the, uh, um, to the gambler who has lost, we would be giving uh, the gambler, the unsuccessful, the unlucky, uh, the, the gambler who's, who's had bad option luck, more resources from the point of view of equality than he's entitled to. Now, um, I think it's a mistake to think that it follows from the fact that parenting is an ambition with which parents identified that equality permits or requires that parents internalize the cost of children. So within a defensible ideal of equality, the fact that parents choose or identify with their ambitions only serves one particular purpose. That's to say it disqualifies parents from adducing one possible ground for compensation. That's to say it, adduces, it, it, it prevents them from saying that, that they would be at the short, land, the short end of a brute lack inequality or that they would suffer an unchosen disadvantage. This is not what is in question. So I agree with, with, with that. I agree that the, with, with the claim that we, we cannot say of parents that they are entitled to having the cost of children be shared because they're at the short end of a brute lack inequality. But being at the short end of a brute lack inequality is not the only egalitarian reason for why, within an egalitarian view, someone may have a claim to having more resources than others, more material resources than others. Whether or not parents may, by dint of their ambitions, or should, have more or fewer resources than others depends crucially on how our egalitarian view tells us that we should treat our different ambitions. So assuming that we have dealt with any brute luck inequality, so people are not different in respects that are not traceable to their ambitions, so there are no inequalities in brute talents or no inequalities in other forms of brute luck, such as what family one is born into, for example. Assuming that we have dealt with those inequalities, what does justice require with regard to what should follow from people's exercise only of their different ambitions? So the gambler and the non-gambler have different ambitions. We need to know how we should price, how equality requires that we should price those different ambitions. And as the example of the gambler makes it clear, this is a question that it's obvious that we must address. We don't think, no egalitarian thinks, that the ambition to gamble and the ambition to play safe should have the same price. Or, that, or we could put it in different terms. In the past, I've put it in different terms. Or that the consequences of the choice to gamble, the stakes of that choice, should be the same or equal to the stakes of the choice to play safe. And similarly, for example, egalitarians believe that and Dworkin uh, is not alone here, that uh, the fabled ant who chooses to work long days to gather food supplies would be not only permitted but required by egalitarian justice to end up better off than grasshopper who chooses to spend time lounging around, assuming again that ant and grasshopper differ only in their ambitions, not in their capacities to gather seeds. So we should ask, is there any part of our egalitarian theory that justifies pricing the parental ambition favorably? Now, I think that a defensible idea of equality supports treating uh, productive ambitions differently and in terms of uh, material resources more favorably than non-productive ones. And the ambition to undertake, re undertake reproductive work is relevantly like a productive ambition. Let me begin first with a case uh, that um, I draw on Dworkin for, uh, involving uh, the production of commodifiable goods. So uh, it's a highly idealized case involving only two individuals, uh, Adrian and Bruce, who differ only in their productive ambition regarding how to use a previously unowned piece of land, a scarce resource which the community um, must allocate uh, justly. Now, the difference between them is that while Bruce wishes to use it as a tennis court for himself, Adrian wishes to use it to produce tomatoes, which other people in the community want. How is it just to price Adrian's and Bruce's different ambitions? Would it be fair if they were treated comparably, for example, by giving them each half of the land? 
or supposing this is in Dworkin's very idealized initial auction uh, stage, supposing they have equal clamshells they could use to bid for the land, would it be fair if the community charged Adrian the very same price as he would charge Bruce? Or alternatively, would it be fair if having charged Adrian a price that was fixed, would it be fair if the community redistributed the tomatoes Adrian grows to those who want them without allowing him to reap some of the benefits by selling them, nor recoup the costs that he incurred in growing them? Now, the answer Dworkin gives, and that I agree with, is, is negative. Equality requires that ambitions be priced, and this is, I think, a crucial uh, egalitarian ideal, in line with the true opportunity cost to others of appropriating those resources. So equality requires, let me say that again, that ambitions be priced in line with the true opportunity costs that devoting scarce resources to those ambitions has for others. Now the opportunity costs are the potential benefits that we miss out on, what we have to forego as a result of resources being assigned to one person rather than another. And so the benefits as well as the cost that result from each person's appropriation of a scarce resource that is up for distribution determine what the opportunity costs are to others of that person's appropriating that resource. Because Adrian would produce something that others want or need on the land, whereas Bruce would fence it off for his private use, the opportunity cost to others in the community of Bruce's appropriating the land are higher than those of Adrian's appropriating it. And so in this specific sense, we could say that Adrian's ambition is cheaper than Bruce's. And this should be reflected in Adrian's and Bruce's respective bundles. Right? So if we're trying to ascertain when their bundles count as equal, we should price their ambitions differently. Adrian's is cheaper, as I've said, in this, by the lights of the opportunity cost to others metric. Now, equality of resources in this sense, I think, captures considerations of productive fairness. And by productive fairness, I mean um, the following. I'm just going to check. Oops. No, that's it. Um, assuming that people differ only in their ambitions, it's unfair to producers to treat benefits they create as being, morally speaking, fully on a par with manna from heaven, which must or may be redistributed equally without the fact that someone produced it making any difference to how producers fare relative to non-producers. And so I think there are various ways of, uh, uh, we can think of productive fairness as a family of different views and egalitarian productive fairness is, is the ideal that I'm after. So you might think producer entitlement is another way of capturing considerations of productive fairness. Desert as contribution is another way of capturing ideas of productive fairness. I'm suggesting that we don't need to rely on these ideals to capture these considerations. So to capture the idea that the fact that someone produced something when people differ only in their ambitions can make a difference to their claims. I'm just going to... I'm sorry, I've not followed up with the slide. This was the principle of productive fairness, right. Um, I think the same considerations, the very same considerations come into play when we focus on the ambition to have and raise children, assuming what I said I would assume throughout, namely that children are net public goods. And just by way of illustration, and I hope this doesn't cause offence, we can uh, imagine a second Adrian and Bruce example in which Adrian now would like to use scarce resources which are up for distribution, not for growing tomatoes, but for having and raising a child. Now here as well, to know what Adrian's account should be charged, what the price of parenting should be, we should know what the opportunity costs are to others of scarce resources being put to this use rather than devoted to other purposes instead. And if we grant, as I said I would, that Adrian's parenting ambition is productive, it, it creates goods that others need or want, then Adrian will spend time and energy and some of his material resources in raising a child in, who will in due time be an asset to society. If we grant this, then Adrian's bundle of resources should reflect that fact. It would be unfair to Adrian to price his parental ambition as if it were expensive, when in fact, in the relevant sense, by the lights of this true opportunity cost to other metrics, it's a cheap preference or cheap ambition. Adrian's ambition would wrongly be priced as expensive if he had to say this, pay the same price as Bruce for the land. Now, um, I won't go over um, uh, what I wanted to say at length, which is to say that there are many differences, of course, between production of commodifiable and non-commodifiable goods. And one of the key differences is that with commodifiable goods, 
we have reasons and, uh, to set up a market uh, to, uh, and, and in particular to uh, ascribe full private property rights or almost full private property rights in some, uh, to uh, individuals over the resources uh, or, or the goods that they produce. Um, but this is not an implication necessarily of productive fairness. So productive fairness just tells us that an ambition that is productive shouldn't be uh, more expensive, uh, should, be treat, should be treated uh, by the, the metric of opportunity cost to others. It is a cheaper ambition, and this should be reflected in one's overall uh, bundle of resources. This can be done in different ways, either by giving according individuals rights to, the, to, to uh, reap income from selling what they produce, or in the case of non-commodifiable goods, uh, by giving individuals claims to share in the costs. And uh, I have a separate kind of argument for why I think that we should choose, of course, a regime in which we share both the costs and the benefits of children rather than privatizing both, which is what some people have advocated. I think as egalitarians, we have those reasons, but that's not relevant here. I know I'm nearly out of time. Um, so um, I would just like to conclude by um, putting forward uh, very briefly a re response or my reaction to um, the second challenge I mentioned earlier, no, no need for incentives. Let me just briefly, however, very briefly take stock. So I've argued so far that liability for ambitions is ungrounded. Uh, so even if we accept that parenting is an ambition, even if we accept that people may be held liable for some of the costs of their choices, egalitarian justice does not justify asking parents to bear the full costs of children, quite the opposite. When children are public goods, their parents' ambition qualifies as productive, and productive ambitions are not expensive ambitions by the light of uh, equality. So it'd be unfair to parents to ask them to pay the costs for them that don't in fact reflect the true opportunity cost to others of those ambitions. Now, there is a second challenge, um, and the challenge in part arises, this is, this is now turning to, to, to uh, Dworkin and, and kind of, uh, um, debates over what, what Dworkin's view really was. But Dworkin says, um, sometimes uh, suggests with regard um, to, um, to productive fairness, to what I call productive fairness, that it kind of piggy rides on or is conditional upon incentives being needed to get Adrian, remember the tomato producer, to produce. And so um, colleagues with whom I've discussed this, this view um, have, and who contest my, interpret, my reading of Dworkin, but also think there is uh, an objection to the view I've suggested to this kind of uh, simpler view of productive fairness, not an incentive constraint, they say, the following. Look, granted, the opportunity cost to others is part of what determines the fair price of ambitions, but it's not the only thing. What also matters is the non-instrumental benefit to the producer of exercising the ambition that he has. So it's the, it's the benefit that accrues to him as a result not of being paid, but whether he sh that's what's in question, but as a result of the sheer fact that he's able to realize his ambition, right? So, if Adrian really enjoys, they say, growing tomatoes, that should make also a difference to whether his ambition is viewed as expensive or inexpensive. Right? So if Adrian really wants the land to grow tomatoes, quite independently of whether he will be able to sell them and, and retain the income from, that he will make from selling them, then equality does not require adjusting the price for land. So in that sense, claims of uh, productive fairness, in a way, are uh, uh, conditional upon incentives being needed. Um, now, what I would like to say here, and, and I hope we'll have the opportunity to discuss this uh, more, is that if this view were correct, it may still be that sharing the cost of children under many circumstances would be justified, right? So this is going to be, we're going to be hostage to uh, considerations, partly empirical considerations, as to what is needed to maintain the fertility rate that is deemed to be desirable. But instead of talking about that, I'd like to um, put to you the following idea. I think we should reject the incentive-constrained view 
Because if the view were justified, the case for sharing the cost of children would be, um, sorry, if the incentive view were justified, then the uh, egalitarian theory in question would uh, reflect a certain bias. Uh, I call it a bias in favor of narrow self-interest. To make my point, let me just introduce um, very briefly a last more variegated version of the Adrian and Bruce example. Now, the Adrians and Bruce's in question are described as being different from each other in terms of both whether their preference is productive and in terms of whether they're narrowly self-interested or other regarding, right? That's the, and I should apologize in the bottom left, the, please ignore the bracket needs incentives question mark. Um, so, what I wish to illustrate um, with this slide uh, is, is the following. If we um, endorse um, the incentive um, constrained view, so the view that considerations of productive fairness are only triggered when incentives are needed, then generous Adrian, who cultivates tomatoes, I'm imagining, so as to benefit a local charity and in the process unavoidably, unavoidably produces extra tomatoes which the community takes for free, he will not count as having any claims of productive fairness. On my view, that's not the case. So on my view, generous Adrian uh, will have those claims. Generous Adrian, in, on my view, will be treated differently from original Bruce, who had the completely non-productive preference. He just ambition. He just wants the land for his own use. Uh, Ad, generous Adrian, but not Bruce, will have a claim to an adjusted price for the land on the grounds, as I mentioned earlier, that the net opportunity cost to others of the lands going to generous Adrian are positive, whereas they're negative in Bruce's case. And my view would also, in principle, tell in favor of treating generous Adrian uh, on a par with business Adrian on the grounds, again, of the opportunity to others, true opportunity cost to others metric. I can say, by the lights of that metric, the opportunity costs to the community of either appropriating the land, I'm assuming, are the same. But on the incentive-based uh, view, generous Adrian would be treated on a par with Bruce, and he would also be worse off in resource term than businessman Adrian, who would be allowed to retain the profits he makes from selling tomatoes, as this is needed for him to actually Incur, uh, engage in this activity. And all I wish to say, um, because it's late, is that I cannot see why fairness, as opposed to efficiency, should require or even just permit businessman Adrian to be better off than generous Adrian. It seems incompatible with fairness for generous Adrian to be treated as if his ambition were costly, moreover, uh, to the community as Bruce's is, when they're in fact not equally uh, costly. So. Um, I think one advantage of the um, unconstrained view, of the view that productive fair considerations don't, are not conditional upon incentive considerations, is that it allows us to say something that many people want to say, which is that those who have altruistic or other regarding ambitions that do succeed in benefiting others should not be penalized as a result. And I'll stop there. Thank you.